Today's video is very important to me as a Christian. I'm going to be talking about why I believe God found it necessary to become a man, Jesus Christ, and die on a cross for my sins and the sins of the whole world. Now, Muslims and Jews do not agree with this theology, and of course there are people who, uh, of other faiths who disagree with it as well. So I'll be explaining why I, as a Christian, believe this to be true, that Jesus Christ is God and died for my sins, and your sins too. I need you, my audience, to acknowledge, regardless of your faith, that the Bible presents Jesus as God and as having came to earth to die for your sins. Okay, keeping in mind that I'm not asking you to believe the Bible's true, I'm just asking you to believe that the Bible does say this. Let's start in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus here is called God by God the Father. We're not going to talk about the Trinity yet, I'll make another video about that, but just the Bible does say this. Hebrews 1, 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Who is God? The Son. If you flip back to the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verse 14, it says, But, said Moses to God, When I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, if they ask me what is his name, what am I to tell them? God replied, I am who I am. Then he added, This is what you shall tell the Israelites, I am sent me to you. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered in John 8:58. Before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus used the name of God for himself. The people at the time picked up stones to kill him when he said this. John chapter 11 verse 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. John chapter 12 verse 44, Jesus speaking, When a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. John 10 verse 30, I and the Father are one. John 3:36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains John on him. John 14, 9. He who has seen me has seen the Father. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, so now we all agree that the New Testament says Jesus is God. Now, if you're a Jew, you're going to be saying, well, the New Testament's just not true. And if you're a Muslim, you're saying that someone changed the New Testament. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the Old Testament, which is the book that the Jews use. We're going to prove to the Jews that the Messiah was to be God. Now, the Muslims are going to claim that the Jews corrupted the Old Testament scriptures to make Jesus look like the Messiah. But it's the Jews who reject Jesus. So that's a lie. We found the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1948, and they date back over 2,000 years ago, so before Jesus was born. And they contain many of the Old Testament scriptures we use today, including a full scroll of the Isaiah prophecies. So Isaiah foretold the coming of the Messiah, who would be God. So to say a Jew changed the scriptures before Jesus was born to make Jesus look like the Son of God is a complete lie. It's ridiculous. So this very studious rabbi... He's copying the scriptures, and he says to himself, hmm, I'm going to make the prophecies, I'm going to corrupt them, and, uh, and risk hellfire, and I'm going to make Jesus, uh, the Messiah he doesn't know anything about, because he wasn't born yet, he's going to make Jesus look like the Messiah. Do you realize how stupid that sounds? Okay, so flip back to your Old Testament and read Isaiah 7.14, which says a virgin will conceive and give birth, and the son will be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Then read from Isaiah 9.6, where it says the child to be born will have the government upon his shoulders, who will be the everlasting father, the prince of peace, mighty God. That's uh, pretty clear. Micah. Chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, that's where Jesus was born, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from eternity. Only God is from eternity. So here we have a ruler coming from Bethlehem, which is where Jesus came from, and the person's going to be from eternity, God. Now, I can go to a local synagogue, open up the scriptures, and find those prophecies in their own text, and they'll still reject Jesus as their Messiah. So, this is not a conspiracy of the Jews trying to make Jesus look like the Messiah. They're the ones who are so adamantly against it, as adamant as the Muslims. Now, let's look at what Jesus said concerning his origins. John 6:38 says, Jesus speaking, For I have come down from heaven. So, Jesus is not from earth like us men. He's from heaven. John 17, verse 5 says, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. 
Jesus existed in heaven before the world began. Who's that? Now God makes it explicitly clear that he shares his glory with no one. Yet Jesus says, I share my glory with the Father. Clearly Jesus is God, because he says he and the Father are one. Now, I'm going to talk about the Trinity in another video, but just to quickly touch upon it, uh, God is not bound by mathematical limitations. He's one God, but he's expressed himself to us in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's no contradiction in that. Water can be solid, liquid, and gas. There's three parts to a peach. There's the seed, the skin, and the meat. I mean, we see things that are one in threes throughout all of nature. Why should God be any less complex than the simplest things in our reality? This is the most profound prophecy in all of scripture. Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. It will be built again with the plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after sixty-two weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Everlasting righteousness was to be ushered in. Sin was to be put an end to when Messiah comes. Then Messiah was to be cut off, and then the temple was to be destroyed. Messiah came just on time as those 60 weeks were decreed. Jesus came, he died, he was cut off, and then the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Either Jesus is the Messiah, or there is none. When Jesus was on the cross, he quoted Psalm 22, which is a depiction of crucifixion. It talks about having your hands and feet pierced and having uh, your bones out of joint, completely a picture of crucifixion, and written before crucifixion was even invented. Isaiah 53 talks about the suffering servant who would come to die for the sins of the people of the world. Uh, and there's, there's plenty of proof that Messiah was to be cut off and die in the Old Testament. And then, of course, the New Testament's full of it. Uh, I don't even have to prove to you that Jesus was crucified in the New Testament, in all four of the Gospels. So, there it is. Now, if you know anything about the Old Testament, you see sacrifice after sacrifice throughout the whole thing. When mankind first sinned, when Adam ate the forbidden fruit, God killed an animal and clothed Adam in its skin. Very, from the very beginning, sacrifice has always been part of the atonement. In fact, there's no other atonement other than blood. That's what the New Testament says. Without the shedding of blood, there is no atonement or forgiveness of sin. So, also look at Leviticus, which is the third book of Moses, I think, third or second. Leviticus says, the blood on the altar makes atonement for sin. And if you look at the uh, book of Exodus, chapter 24, it says, Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant. And then if you look in the Gospels, it, Jesus gave the new covenant in his blood. So, all throughout scripture we see sacrifice is what makes atonement for sins. There is no other way. Now, I would love Muslims and Jews alike to explain to me why the Jews, according to prophecy, have gone many years without a sacrifice, and also why, according to their scriptures, they need one, yet neglect to make one. Jesus said that, you know, it would be an abomination to make more sacrifices after he has come. So, spiritually, though, the Jews uh, don't you know, acknowledge Jesus, they don't make sacrifices anymore. Clearly, even though they don't recognize it physically, spiritually, they know they don't need to anymore. And at the same time, the Muslims must claim, you know, to make the Quran look like it's feasible, they claim that the Jewish people corrupted their own scriptures, but why would they do that to make it look like they need a blood sacrifice and then neglect scripture? And now Muslims and Jews alike will say that God doesn't need to die on a cross to forgive us. He can just forgive us like snapping his fingers. I'm afraid that would make him evil, and I'll explain to you why. If you're standing before a judge guilty of murder, rape, and robbing a bank, if the judge just says, okay, I forgive you, you can go, that would make the judge evil, wouldn't it? Justice must be served to all evil. God cannot wink at evil. He must destroy every last bit of it. If he doesn't destroy any all evil, and if he tolerates even a little bit of it, that means God's a compromising judge, which would make him evil. God is good, holy, and perfect, and sin well, any sin, even the tiniest sin in his sight, is abundantly sinful. He must destroy it. So, here's what happened. You owed a debt to God, so did I. And that debt was death. The wage of sin is death, and a wage is something you earn. We have earned death. And we can't pay that, because that means going to hell forever. Spiritual death. So, here's what happened. God came off the judge stand. He said, look, I know you're, I know you're repentant, and this is only to people who are repentant and believe in Jesus Christ. He looks at our hearts, God knows our hearts, he says, look, I know you're repentant, but there's a price to pay, death. So, I'm going to pay the price for you. Let's say you owed a billion dollars to the judge. 
The judge comes off the stand, writes you a check for a billion dollars, and justice is served. In Jesus Christ, the sinless Lamb of God, he died for our sins and thus satisfied the judgment of God against sin. So, the wage of sin, death, has been paid. Jesus died for us. Zero times any number is zero. Jesus had no sin. So, my sins, let's say I have a billion trillion sins, times Jesus' zero sins equals zero sins. I'm clean because Jesus is clean. He has granted me his righteousness. Now, to say God can just forgive you without the atonement would mean that God just winks at sin and lets it go. That's not a just God. God must judge evil, and he did that in Jesus Christ.